parrot hormones get blamed for a lot of different behaviors, from biting and screaming to attacking family members. And it's true that many parrots are seasonal breeders and can experience a surge of nesting behaviors during a certain time of year that lead to what we call hormonal behavior. It's also true that the way that we care for our parrots keeps them in a less natural state of robustness that can keep them in the family way for longer periods of time. But hormonal behavior has become a scapegoat for a lot of our poor husbandry skills. It's important to state here that hormonal behavior is shorthand for reproductive-based behavior because hormones influence all kinds of behavior that look very different from one behavior to the next. Our lack of understanding of what helps keep them successful is generally what we see when we have behavior challenges. We have a hard time recognizing the long-term fallout of how our actions impact relationships when the consequences aren't immediate. So how do we know if our parent, parrots are experiencing hormonal behavior and what do we do about it? That's what we're going to find about now. So what is the purpose of hormonal behavior? Well, we see pair bonding, defending territory, remodeling their nesting space. And the types of behaviors that we see are a lot of chewing. We're going to see maybe some regurging or regurgitation, copulatory behavior, territory defending could be considered hormonal behavior, which is like charging at household members, and also increase of vocalization, general irritability, remodeling of the nesting space, which kind of feels like you're in a Chip and Joanna Gaines special, chewing a lot of wood, chewing door trims, drywall, and spending a lot of time under the bed, bathroom, closets, cabinets, hidey huts, or even buckets. So a lot of those behaviors could just be general parrot behavior, but they could contribute to hormonal behavior. So what are the types of things that contribute to what we see as parrot hormonal behavior? We see diets rich in sugars and fats, a lot of pair bonding type behaviors like heavy petting, sedentary lifestyle without a lot to do, a lack of scenery change, which contributes to a strong establishment of territory, photo period, access to nesting spaces, the age of the parrot, which also includes their species and ethology, which is their natural behavior, and duetting. Some people call me the space cowboy. So not just one or the other of these concepts contributes to what we see as reproductive behavior. It is multifactorial. Many people generally, generally rely too heavily on one or the other, and they disregard all of the other things. That's why it's often incorrect to diagnose your bird as hormonal, because hormonal behavior is a construct. It's a placeholder for a lot of different behaviors that we see. Many times a parrot is actually too young to be hormonal, and I've seen this in a lot of people diagnosing lovebirds and macaws as hormonal. More often than not, the parrot is acting in a way that our behavior has taught them, and the behavior will not stop no matter how many injections of Lupron we use to change until we change our behavior. So the problem is, is that we become frustrated because we aren't changing the true root of the problem. And this is why parrots get rehomed, labeled as bad pets, and so on. When the problem was us the whole time. So if in fact a parrot is acting hormonally, we are giving them too much access to too many breeding rich stimuli and we're frustrating the heck out of them. Now I often tell this story about my Moluccan cockatoo Sam who fell in love with my partner Andre. Now it was actually really dangerous to me and there were no food treats that were acceptable to him that I could differentially reinforce his behavior for better behavior. I realized that he had access to the newspapers in his indoor aviary and this was helping him create nesting space and build that strong pair bond, pair bond to the love of his life. Everything changed when I stopped letting him have access to those newspapers. Now cut to five years later, everything had been different and I gave him a bucket and all of a sudden his screaming and his attacking behavior went way up. How do we know if our parrot is acting hormonally or not? Now, first of all, we need to look at what our parrot is specifically doing. 
Behaviors that are pair bonding and nest seeking are generally reproductive based. So biting and screaming and attacking fam family members are a gray area. This means we can manage environmentally con environmental conditions and see if we notice behavioral differences. Taking data is an important part of the behavior change process. It might feel clunky and it might feel clinical, but it is the actual way that we find out if we are doing something different and if it will work or it doesn't work. Otherwise, we're just throwing spaghetti against the wall. This leads to frustration because we might actually have tried something that could help, but we aren't implementing it long enough to feel any lasting effects. This is where we get the idea that we have tried everything because behavior changes and it changes in the face of different consequences. Nothing lasts forever. We just have to implement the correct strategies the correct way. So biting, screaming, and attacking may have hormonal roots, but what else might? Now this is where regurgitating, masturbating, or rubbing the vent, or cloaca as we call it, on toys or resting toys on the parrot's back are also considered stimulating behaviors. So what's the big deal with diagnosing a parrot with reproductively inspired hormonal behavior? Now first, there are a lot of ways that we can manage this behavior correctly through our behavior as well as environmental cues. Second, it's important to understand how to correct, correctly assess learned behavior from natural ethology. Learned behavior happens because the parrot is getting something valuable out of it. It means we have somehow created the conditions to make this behavior make sense to our parrot. So while it's true that some parrots have different temperaments than others, and we can think of these differences like the differences between blue throat macaws and hyacinths, African greys or Amazons, lovebirds and cockatiels, it also means that we have a responsibility to interact with those parrots in different ways that bring out their best. The other part about hormonal behavior in parrots is that we hyper-focus on the wrong thing, like photo period. How many times have you heard that parrots need to have 12 hours of sleep to avoid those hormonal surges in the spring? This is an overgeneralization that is not exactly true. Some parrots are equatorial, which would mean that their range is within 5 to 10 degrees of the equator. This also means that though they generally have a pretty stable photo period, they don't necessarily get the same amount of sleep every single night. It also means that not all parrots are springtime breeders. For instance, my white cockatoos start to exhibit nesting behavior in January here in Southern California, and many black cockatoos are fall nesters. For more information on photo period and sleep, we have a very in-depth web class on this subject and how it may or may not relate to your parrot's behavior challenges. Check out the links in the caption below for this web class and you'll get some amazing information on your specific species of parrot. We also look at other factors besides photo period that impact reproductive behavior. For instance, like humidity and bath times. We focus on simple fixes such as photo period for our hormonal parrots because it's also very manageable. Simply putting the parrot to bed earlier, giving it full darkness for 12 hours, and then we are likely to fix the biting and tacking problem sounds really sexy. But again, photo period is one thing that we can look at, but it's not the only thing. When this doesn't work, we go to another simple fix, and unfortunately, it's a pharmaceutical one, Lupron. Lupron is a set of hormone injections given to parrots. I have seen Lupron offered to Amazon parrots that were biting their owner's hands or feather plucking. Now, my experience is not one as a veterinary professional, but as someone who has seen a lot of behavior as a behavior specialist, where Lupron and other hormone treatments have a positive impact in some areas, like the scary side effects of hormonal behavior, where our environmental management hasn't made an impact, such as egg laying. But even still, there are some parrots that I have worked with that have experienced a lot of egg laying that we were able to change all of that without any medical treatments at all. We would want to use medical treatments as a last resort because it is really invasive. We are looking at injecting our parrots regularly, which can be problematic on its own. And any time we have to engage in these kinds of procedures, it's something that we really want to look at our practices, even getting a second veterinary opinion and really examining if there are all alternatives. Messing around with hormones is not something to take lightly. It's also not even necessarily something that will work if we don't manage the environmental conditions ourselves. 
we will still likely to see issues like biting and screaming and feather destructive behavior and more if we keep exposing the problem stimuli to our parrot. What does work if we have a behavior challenge that might be reproductively linked is first assessing your parrot's diet. According to board certified avian veterinarian, Dr. Scott Eccles, most of the parrots in human care are not on an appropriate diet. This can mean a lot of things, but essentially if your parrot gets primarily seed and nuts, then they have a really rich diet. If they have a lot of human food in their diet, or if you're experiencing behavior challenges, it's time to change your parrot's diet. I have seen companion parrot clients come to me with their parrots that eat pizza, gummy worms, cooked chicken and fish, hummus with pita bread, cheese, pretzels, peanut butter cookies, popcorn, dried fruit, and so much more. For many parrots, the only kind of produce they will eat are apples, grapes, oranges, and corn. These items are super high in sugar and must only be fed sparingly or we will see a lot of health issues. Our human diets are not appropriate for parrots at all, and this is frequently why we see parrots with behavior issues. This is not a silver bullet, but changing their diet to one that's higher in fiber and lower in sugars and fats will not instantly fix their behavior, but the energy-rich diets will reduce the baseline on many behaviors and bring better health and health span. Changing the way we act with our parrots will also bring about ch behavior change. This means the petting style that we use, avoiding full body stroking, and possibly even just a lot less pets in general can really help. Beak wrestling and physical contact are generally signs of courtship or even territory disputes, which tell the parrot that there is something to tussle about. When interacting, instead of passive cuddling, engage in training, playing gentle games without getting the parrot too amped up will help stimulate active communication that gives a closed feedback loop for, of information transfer. Long snuggle sessions mean sexy time because they are also seen as allopreening. Bond strengthening can look like a lot of different things based on the bond that we want. We want to avoid a perceived sexual bond. Speaking of territory, switching up their territory to give them new scenery often helps deter nest-seeking behavior as well. Take them for safe outings in a carrier or harness. Next, we can encourage more exercise around their aviary or home space if they aren't flighted, but also engaging in flighted trained behaviors. Keep appropriate toys, avoid nesting type toys like hidey huts, buckets, and even toys that your parrot can rest their back on if they engage in that kind of behavior. This is a stimulant and it is how they mate. Avoid large boxes and bags and even wood for heavy chewers like cockatoos that can stimulate nest remodeling behavior. Now we wanna keep that home space appropriate. I told you about that indoor walk-in aviary where my cockatoos could get under their cage tray papers, which was a nightmare for me. It was so scary with their behavior that one neighbor even charged into my house because he was so mad at me. Fortunately, I figured out my problem and overnight the screaming went down 70% just by taking away my cockatoos perceived nesting spots. Now there are so much that we can untangle about hormones. But the first step is figuring out whether your problem has to do with hormonal behavior or not. Chances are high you're dealing with a whole lot more than just reproductive problems like nest seeking and regurgitation. Check out my YouTube behavior makeover on screaming for a behavior consultation excerpt on our take on why snuggling your parrot instead of active communication causes more problems. See you next time.